First of all, you know Jesus Christ does not judge uh, partially, right? He's impartial in his judgments. I also want you to know that he's the judge of the living and the dead. Uh, there really is something to say that his judgment transcends our life experience. He is not merely a judge like a magistrate like we have in a civil case uh, or something like this. He is the judge of the human soul. Thoughts, deeds, words, actions, intentions, all in the human heart of the things that we are and are, are aware of and are unaware of. Jesus has not only walked on the earth, amassing himself life experience as it is written that he knows what you're going through. He is not unsympathetic in any way, shape, or form. He knows what it feels like to have gravity pulling against your flesh, time, uh, whether that can cause frustration, irritation, pressure, solically, emotionally, at the heart level, or mentally, and to overcome all things. He knows when we have a good intention uh, or a bad intention, and he knows what's on the other side of that, and he's a merciful judge. I want you to also realize that when we talk about judgment, the topic of judgment can be so offensive uh, because it's been misrepresented, it's been misinterpreted by those who have represented it correctly. On the other side are people who have misinterpreted it because they are not in a favorable position. It says in the Word of God that those who look towards the day of judgment with fear are not made perfect by love. And in order for you to accept a statement like that as a truth, which it is, you have to understand that the nature of our judge is one who judges in favor of the church. In other words, a judgment is not guilty. That is a judgment. I don't know that many people have considered when they hear the word judgment, they always consider it uh, as a negative connotation. It's always, judgment is always guilty, bad, punishment, and beloved, I have news for you that when the judge says you are not guilty or you will be rewarded or recompensed, that is a judgment. It is called a favorable judgment. And so when we begin to talk about the judge, you have to understand that he is more in favor of you than you are of yourself. He desires for you to be happy, free, healthy, and blessed more than you desire those things for your own life. This is the judge of the living and the dead, and he's a merciful judge. He's a merciful judge that is not swayed by custom or culture, uh, the passing trends of the world, might I add. He's not a judge that's mindful that no matter how he uh, judges your case, that he will be uh, responsible for the actions. He considered that beforehand and he laid down his life while you were yet in sin. In other words, in our culture, perhaps a judge makes a merciful judgment in the face of a criminal or criminal charge, and he would be liable after that to whosoever would un be uh, unagreeable with his judgments. Could be, again, at, on a media level, it could be on a, a media strike, he could be attacked persecuted, uh, or, or even assaulted for his judgments, whereas Jesus Christ, he has beforehand counted the cost, laid down his life for you, so that no matter what type of sin you could ever find yourself in, he has already liberated you from the bondage of decay, should you choose to repent. And I also want to say that if we are a people of repentance, to keep fruit uh, with repentance, or rather to uh, keep with repentance and bearing our fruit, uh, the judgment should not be a fearful thing for us at all. We should actually pass uh, from fear to a faithful agreement to God's judgments because, again, He judges without partiality. So I'm saying this because we're going to get into some language here that is uh, in, the, in the early addresses of the churches in Revelation, Jesus is more like I, I'm, I, he's kind of more like a covering. I'm, I'm your boss. I'm your husband. I'm your father. I'm, I am, 
I'm on your side, but I want you to kind of straighten up a little bit because you're getting in your own way. I want you to consider your actions because I am, uh, I've considered them uh, and the path ahead is straight. So whoever's not straight either needs to get straight uh, or they're going to find out that there's a guardrail and after the guardrail, there's a cliff. And so we're going to introduce tonight uh, this topic of judgment and the phrase time, time and a half a time. I want you to think about many times in life, uh, there's two things that can happen to you in your forward progress in Christendom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. One, you are moving forward and you are hearing direction from God. Two, you're moving forward and you're not hearing direction from God. One, you're moving forward and there seems to be uh, turbulence, if you will. Uh, There seems to be friction and that's either from the enemy because you're doing what's right or it's from yourself because there are things inside you that are conflicting with the gospel. It could be on a simple level, timing, time, place, could be agenda, could be yourself over God's self, or it could be the Lord, in which case you have to make a decision. Do you believe God is slowing you down, or do you believe you or car is going against the guardrail, or what they call it biblically is kicking against the pricks? And this statement, kicking against the pricks, actually comes from an ox goad uh, or a goad that's on a, uh, if you've ever seen a yoke on the oxen, it's a beautiful piece of wood about this big around and it goes like this and then it has two steel uh, rings, U-rings, that the oxen go in and it keeps them unified. So even if one goes this way and one goes like that, they're not going to get past the steel bar, so they always stay about this close together. Well, that's the one thing is to keep them going uh, east or west, right? But to keep them moving forward, this is only one system of controls, right? Navigating. Now you have to move forward, and what happens is what if they don't want to go forward? You have these thousand-pound animals that don't feel like plowing today. Well... They have something called uh, an ox goad, and it is a sharp stick, a literal sharp, or it's called an ox goad or a prick, uh, and it's a sharp stick. Like if you can imagine me taking a wooden broom handle and chopping it at a 60 degree angle, so it's very, very sharp, and that's kind of right behind you to keep you motivated. And what happens is if the ox slows down, he gets pricked. And so what, he does, what does he do? As a natural reaction, he starts to kick against the pricks. They're designed in such a way that they can't uh, kick them with their feet to get it off, but that doesn't stop the animal from trying. Uh, and so, you know, to speak perfectly, for an example, when the Apostle Paul was persecuting the church, Jesus shows up and he uses this language and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are kicking against the pricks or the goads, which basically means the current is going this way. That's a one way and you're going the wrong way. The only difference is unlike a street, as long as there's no cars coming at you, you can still do that. When the movement is God and he's moving that way, no one is able to uh, wrestle with that force uh, and prevail when it is moving uh, in the opposite direction. I'm not saying you can't wrestle with God. Look at Jacob wrestled with God and his name was changed to Israel, but there was no wrestling against the inevitable. God called him to be a, God called Jacob into fellowship before Jacob was born. So Jacob wanting a blessing was not really outside of God's will, if you understand what I'm saying. If he was asking God to do something God did not intend on doing, Uh, that's a battle he would not find himself uh, victorious in. Okay, so you follow where I'm saying is what we need, what tools we need to navigate our discernment. For this reason, the Bible says we have been given testimony. We've been giving men and women of old for a reason to serve as examples. For an example, when we were in the wilderness for 40 years, they served as an example of what to do and not to do. Uh, There's many things in the Word of God, again, this is Logos or Rhema, 
And the rhema speaks to you about today, your situation, your circumstance. Yes, it's going to be different. Is there anyone in the Bible who drives a car and has a cell phone? No. Is there someone in the Bible who wrestles with the timing of God? Uh, a, a relationship, purity, impurity, greed, mercy, kindness, healing, struggling with some type of frustration, wrestling for a breakthrough, contending for healing. Yes, all of these things which speak loudly to us. But we're going to talk about judgments. Let's do this. Let's read Thyatira. And when we get into this language, we'll take a hiatus and we'll start combing through the Word of God to give some examples uh, on how would you tell? How would you tell the difference if you're moving forward with your whole heart and you're discovering friction? Is it from the enemy? Is he resisting you? Is it from God? Because would God even do that? Am I going too fast? Am I on the wrong road? Is, or is God stopping this because he doesn't want me to do it? Or is God open-armed blessing me and, I'm, and God wants me to move forward, but I'm on the side of the highway and so my car's bumpy and God kind of has nothing to do with it. He's already paved the road and said, come forth. Again, great questions. Uh, most of the time you will find when believers are most frustrated or upset uh, is either A, they call it the breakdown before the breakthrough. And it's right before, you know, it's the, the before the rainbow is the most vehement lightning, the, uh, the ice and thunder. And after that, then comes the rainbow. After the darkest, coldest night, then the most beautiful sunset. On the dark, cold, uh, the most trying time ever, Jesus on the cross. The apostles are scattered. We have no idea. I thought we were supposed to be in victory. How is this that our master is slayed before our eyes? Having no idea that a matter of hours later, we are going to see the first permanent resurrection in history. And from that moment that all men who breathe the breath of life would be resurrected on the glory who trust in his name. So I challenge you as we read the word of God tonight to begin making statements. Here's what happens. And there's a lot of time uh, in deep type of deliverance ministries. What you'll find is you're un imagine you have a bomb and it's wired to detonate at a later date, whether that's, you know, minutes, moments or hours or weeks or days later, it's pre-wired because somebody wired it to detonate at a certain time. And you can imagine what you would call like an inner vow or a soul agreement as you make a statement because of a circumstance or situation that is going to detonate later. I remember times, one time I was working with a brother and, I, and there was something I, I, I did that was so, I tried to clean, the, we were working on an all night thing and I used some air to compress, to, to cool off the computer. What you're supposed to do, I, you know, you read the can. I talk to the boss. You're supposed to do it every, you know, couple hundred uh, waves or files or every so and so many hours to keep the system running clean. Well, as you know, we're having a great night. We're working on our, you know, it's like our 23rd hour on the job. It was, a, again, a very long, arduous shift. And I'm starting to blow the computer. And all of a sudden, he, he loses it. And he accuses me that I'm going to blow up this, like, $90,000 machine. And it's like... I'm just blowing the thing out. And so here's what I don't know is in high school, he was up all night doing a test and his friend came and did the air thing and it blew up his computer, you know, somehow. And it's like, you know, what are the chances of that? I don't know. But anyway, I went from, we had perfect peace. We're getting it done. And now you're ready to fight me. And all I did was blow the air dust on the computer. And what I didn't realize is he had a uh, kind of like when you see a cute little dog and you go to pet it and it winces like this or grimaces. And what you don't know is before you came onto the scene with, with love in your heart and kindness in your eyes and you just wanted to touch the fluffy animal, you don't know that it was terribly abused by someone who looked exactly like you. And so when you go to pet the you know, cute little dog. It's so terrified that you're going to hurt it again. And you know what? That's, that's the story of most humans you'll meet in a fallen world is they have these what's called idiosyncrasies or things that are pre-decided inside that are going to, at the right time, when you put pressure on that spot that they've been hiding, 
it's going to collapse and you're going to see something coming from them that is not the fruit of Jesus Christ. So what do we do? Okay. First of all, this is what makes famous the gift of repentance. Sometimes it takes uh, very skilled or anointed counseling. Most of the time, you simply need to break the agreement. Most people don't realize there's agreement there unless the Holy Spirit brings it to, to light. But here's the point of me telling you this. Upon reading and studying tonight, looking at judgments through the eyes and lenses of the scriptures, I want you to start making some positive confessions at the heart level. For an example, God is just. God is just is a positive uh, agreement with your soul. It's a, like a, uh, if you will, it's, it's a positive affirmation or a word affirmation. It's a statement for you to encrypt or write on your heart. Sometimes you'll say, file this away or write it on the tablet of your heart. So that next time you're going through something and you say, why me? Why would God do that? Why is this happening to me? You say, wait a minute. First of all, let's, let's look at this in the right light. God is just, which means he's not going to do or allow something that is unjust. Okay, so there's all the pressure goes off. Now, from that perspective, let's, let's reason through this. Now, when you don't have that and you're not sure what's on the other side of door number two or what is in the heart of the individual you're speaking with, I don't know if you've ever talked to someone and they get all defensive and you just asked a tiny little question. It could happen to anyone. And all of a sudden, it's like after you get in this long fight two hours later, you realize, well, that's not what I meant or I never, that's not why I asked you that. They go, oh, and all of a sudden it's like, well, we wasted two hours, but it's all good. The reason that these statements need to be made is because what the devil is going to do, sometimes all he has to do is question a question. And by your insecurities, you will talk yourself in or out of a circumstance or situation that God never wanted you to get in. He's not even said a word and you've already made an argument for and against yourself in his name when he has nothing to do with that perspective. And why does that happen? It's because the absence of these truths in the human heart. You follow what I'm saying here? Let's look at uh, the text here. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Hallelujah. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. Now listen, Jezebel, if you know anything about the original Jezebel uh, and her husband Ahab, these people did not have the heart, mind, soul, or, or, or anything of God why would you give someone like that time to repent at all, right? And this, exa it's, this example happens today. Someone committed a heinous crime and the victim or the families of the victim, it's like just take them to the nth degree because we are affected, no one else is affected, but then someone of godly character comes in and says, actually, it's, you need to forgive them. They don't know, and the person says, how could you forgive them? They did this thing to me or to my loved one or to my life. And, and again, this goes back to that God is just. He knows what you know and what you don't know. Many of you today are not who you were yesterday. And yesterday you may have done something to someone or to yourself that today you can't, it's hard to believe that that's the same person. You didn't know better. You weren't raised right. You had to choose the, between two evils. Which one was, uh, was least? It's kind of like uh, something about this is, say you're driving your car and you look next to someone and they look like someone you know. So you look at them intently, but they've just come out of a culture where if someone looks at them, it's because they want to fight. And you look over, they go like this, they're ready to fight. Now you're scared because you're like, I guess that's not Jim, you know, and now you have a choice to make. It's like you're driving down the street and they're swerving their car at you. And it's like, 
what do you do? How did this even happen? And these, again, these things happen all the time. Amen? I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Now, can you be given time to repent of something you're unaware of that you're in transgression? In other words, I'm doing something wrong. Nobody's told me, and God's given me time. Time to figure out on my own? Or do you think there's something here that we need to uh, interject? Do you think God warns his people? Do you think he corrects? Do you think he rebukes? Absolutely. This is the main role in the Old Testament of the uh, office of the prophet. They were sent out like a spiritual chiropractor to align, typically to align the heart of the king, to get back on the one way, which is Yahweh. The way, the truth, and the light. Jesus Christ to serve and to love God and to establish his kingdom on the earth. Whether they are righteous and they're missing something, whether they are uh, oblivious to it, or whether they are bone wicked, wicked to the bone, they still get a warning. You have to have full knowledge of what you're doing. And this is why, beloved, in, the, in this hour, we cannot remove the word repentance from the gospel. Matter of fact, without the word repentance, if you speak to someone or you preach to them that God is amazing and God loves, without the word repentance, you never actually tell them that they need to change what they're doing or to turn at the heart level, how can they ever be held accountable? How can they ever be made responsible for what they're doing if there's never been a clear and concise word that you are going down the wrong road? How many of you would go the wrong way and your GPS says nothing until you show up? You wouldn't have a problem with that? Of course you would. You would want... No, you would want the GPS to tell you to turn. You would want the GPS to tell you right away, make a U-turn, go right, go left. Now, if you ever are going the wrong way because your heart is carrying you the wrong way and the GPS says turn or someone tells you to turn, what's going to happen? Let's be honest here. Let's reflect just for a moment in life. This is like when someone says, hey, wake me up in an hour or remind me to do this. And then you do it and they get all mad at you. Right? It's like, I'm just doing what you asked me to do. Why are you getting all mad? It's because they're flesh. If the flesh is, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If someone says, wake me up in an hour, I, I got to get up. And then you stand by the bedside and you wake them up and they get all mad at you, uh, which happens a lot, it's because what their flesh and spirit want to do are at enmity with each other. Many times, matter of fact, this is why they killed the prophets. You're telling me to do something that I do not want to do, and because I don't want to do what you're telling me to do, you either have to be quiet and go away because I don't want this pressure or conviction in my life, and if you don't stop saying that, then I'm going to have to make you stop. And so what happens? They take the Lord to the cross. They throw Jeremiah in a prison, in a cistern. They burn the scrolls. They have to find deliverance for this pressure they're feeling. And the way to get delivered is simply to turn and repent. And you'll be back again on the one-way street. You'll flow in the river perfectly and peacefully. But if not, they're kicking against the goads. And what happens, and when someone is decided in their heart, they desire to kick against the goads, the torment becomes unbelievable. Because again, God, God can't be stopped. Amen? And when we're living in enmity with God, and we refuse to repent, it starts decaying us from the soul level. Then the flesh starts, uh, the signs of this decay start becoming evident. First, it's all the fruits of the flesh. 
irritation, uh, enmity, evil, anger. Then it's outbursts of wrath, violent eruptions. Next thing you know, we're cursing. Next thing you know, we're seeking for freedom. And again, if that freedom isn't leaving, then we have to leave. Somehow, we begin to go mad. When, when the simple gift of repentance can cure any rebellion, God does give us time, and He does make it known. Now, sometimes it says in the Bible, God speaks to a man one way or another. He speaks through a dream in the night, and men perceive it not. Now, let me tell you about this. A lot of times you'll find in ministry when they say, quiet your heart or quiet your soul. Uh, we used to work with a brother, and he used to say, I silence all the competing voices. And he was talking about your thoughts, your chatter, what's happening inside your heart or your mind that's louder than the whisper that Elijah got, right? Sometimes people would say, I've been trying to tell you for a year or God's been trying to get a hold of you and you were oblivious to this why. And there's always a reason. Perhaps that's because our intention or our desire is above God's in that what God wants, we don't want to wait for it. Behold, I will throw her into sick. Now, let me ask you this question, because this is, this is now tackling an issue that's very hard to comprehend. If I throw, if I am God, if I am love, and I throw someone on a sick bed, what would a righteous judge, what would a righteous judge do that for? By the way, let me, let me just add something here. Let me give you a hyper right and hyper left. Hyper right is heaven, hyper left is hell, right? Take, take non-believers, right, or someone who they used to go to church and they got offended and they left. They go, why would God send anyone to hell? You're saying he's all love. How can hell exist? And you go, great question. How can you ever ask someone to go to jail? Someone stole your car, burned your house down, and destroyed your family. You're just going to let them go. Oh, you want them to go to jail. So you would be the same way as God. You would separate the righteous from the unrighteous, those who are sober from those who are not, in order to protect those who are doing the will of God. We have maximum security penitentiaries because we find value in separating the righteous from the unrighteous. Amen? Hell is an eternal, uh, a high security, what do you call maximum security for the devil and his angels. Now remember, God did not design us to go to hell. That was never in God's heart. It was made for the devil and his angels. It is a maximum security penitentiary for eternal beings. But what happens is if we are at enmity with the judge of the living and the dead. We can't go to heaven. Where do we go? When you're standing in front of a judge, you have to do what's in the heart of the judge, right? It's the only way because he has been given all authority. Jesus Christ has been given all authority on heaven and earth. He is the judge of the living and of the dead. Now, why would that judge give you community service? Why would he give you a fine? Say you don't go to jail, but you have to do all this stuff. Why would a good, loving, impartial judge do that? It's in hopes that you'd repent, to learn a lesson, to make good happen. For community services so that good can happen in light of what was bad. And so that you can work within you. First of all, it teaches you again how, to, uh, how your hands can work for goodness instead of iniquity. It's kind of like the sacrificial system that... If I sin and I have to bring a goat or a bullock to the temple, what is it doing? It's already rekindling my giving, which is the first thing that stops up when I mess up because your heart condemns you. And the, a closed heart is a heart that doesn't give. An open heart is a giving heart. For God so loved the world that he gave. Was his heart open towards us or closed? Open heart. That's right. This is the posture to give. Beloved, this is the posture to receive. It's open. Why would Jesus throw her onto a sickbed in hopes that she, was rep that she would repent? Look, it says it right here. And those who committed adultery with her, I will also throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. Once they repent, beloved, that's it. The trial's over. The trial is designed 
to get you to repent. What is it designed to do? To get your attention. It really is. It's kind of like when someone says pain is like the greatest prophet. People are going their own way and think they're invincible. They get in a little pain. All of a sudden, they start praying to God, right? Fix me, Lord. And some people will say, well, God would never cause that pain. In other words, there's two camps. God does cause this or allow it, and God doesn't. Well, here we see that in lieu of wickedness, Jesus is going to go ahead and start the process of what? Discipline. You have to remember that discipline is awful. Even if you have a, like, you know, I never liked to be disciplined by my dad, but the Bible says that that produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. We are learning now how to discipline our children, and it's not pleasant ever, not for us and not for them, but it begins to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness in them. In hopes that what? That they turn from the way that's kicking against the goads into the way that is in accordance or in alignment with the spirit of truth. All of the churches will know. Now, what's the fruit of this? What's the fruit of Jesus giving a discipline, allowing time for her to repent? Remember, how good is this judge that even in his judgment, there is a hope for repentance, a hope for mercy. I hope they will change. I didn't get their attention. We'll turn up the volume a little bit here. Turn up the temperature just a little bit here. I will throw her into great tribulation unless she repents of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and the heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching and who have not learned what some say or call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I don't lay on you any other burdens. In other words, Jesus is separating what? The two camps of people. There's no, uh, you know, you're in, uh, you're in together uh, uh, because you're an acquaintance. This is simply, I know what's in your mind and I know what's in your hearts. And remember, the beautiful thing about Jesus is he judges based on what is in the intent of your heart. A a judge can't do that here unless you say it. I didn't mean to do that. Then they believe you. Have you ever got pulled over by an officer? He goes, you're speeding. And you go, yes, I am. (laughs) You know? And sometimes, you know, I remember one time I was was speeding. Uh, I was going back from the Springs, you know, an hour and a half or two hour drive there and back twice a week. And I got pulled over one time, and I knew what I did was wrong. And I, and I was frustrated, and I didn't have time, and I just said, just give me the ticket, officer. And he was like, do you know what you did? I said, just give me the ticket, officer, because it was like I was speeding, and that's not good. What I did was not right, and I just, I need you to discipline me because you can't ever let yourself not, yeah. And other times you get pulled over, and you go, Yo, where, where's that sign, you know? And sometimes you mean it, you know, it's behind that tree that's overgrown and you can't see it. Uh, Or you just weren't paying attention. But either way, that reprimanding causes you next time you're on the road to do what? Yeah, you better you better be mindful of this because it's mindful, right? To the one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end. Other people, you go, you know what, officer, I'm so sorry. I thought it slowed down, but honestly, I was, you know, I, I turned my CD or a car turned out and I, and I turned left. And, and he goes, you know what, thank you for being honest. I'm going to let you go this time because your motive is right. You did not mean to do what's wrong. And I will tell you, every once in a while you've had that and they let you go. And that, that's almost more scary than getting the book thrown at you, right? Because you feel a different weight when you were let go from something that you should have. It was like that, was that movie or or the book Les Miserables? Yeah. They had it in school and I I used to hate reading so bad. The book was this thick. And I'm like, really? You're like fifth grade? Most of them couldn't even read, let alone this thing. So I waited until they showed the movie at the end, you know. And uh, I missed too much of it and I, I missed it all anyway. You know, fortunate for me... Maybe five or six years ago, it was somewhere I was at, they had the show on there, and I saw the guy, and it was a thief, and he stole whatever, and then the, 
the monk came out and he got caught and he goes, oh, no, no, I gave it to him. And he forgot all this other stuff and he loads them up with all of the valuable stuff. And that was such a weight for the thief to know that this monk would basically, uh, you know, cover for him that he changed his life completely. If I, if I, if that correct, if I know the story, whatever I saw about it. And, and the point is that we're going to get to that is that mercy is a higher weight than judgment. Okay. Mercy should make you fear God that he has had your life in his hands. You ever seen those movies where Pontius Pilate's up there and his thumb goes, or gladiator, his thumb goes down, you get the ax, his thumb goes up and you live on. Just to know that your life, your soul, your eternity has been entrusted to someone else's discretion. You better hope they know what's in your heart. Because every once in a while, you can go to jail for something that you didn't do, right? I, I remember so many times people would get mad at me for something I did or didn't do, and it ends up that I actually didn't do it, and it was someone else, or they misread the thing, and it's, but, you know, but it's real. What you go through is real. So you, you really want to judge that it, he doesn't just have good discernment. You want to judge who can see what is in your heart real time. He doesn't have to make, well, I, it sounds like you didn't know what you're doing. I'm going to let you off lightly. You want a judge that can actually just go ahead and look into your heart and see what is actually there. And this is what Jesus is doing to the crowd at Thyatira. Remember this as a city that has had Macedonian culture. Alexander the Great, his generals have overthrown and taken the place. And again, it was given to the empire of Seleucid. Uh, and, and what came in with the influences of Macedonia was the Greco-Roman Empire, the Greek gods. You have now the mythological creatures. Now there's the worship of the sun god Apollos. And things are starting to change. Matter of fact, if you were a Christian in the year 300 and you were like us, you wanted to worship God and go to church today, you would be at a problem now with the city officials because Sunday is the day where Apollos is worshipped and we're, we're going to make peace and you go to your church, I'll go to mine mentality. And they, um, they melded the two, which is how we went from Saturday to Sunday. And all of this is happening here. So there are people who desired to stay with the customs entrusted to them and those who had Roman influence that were like, well, I guess it really doesn't matter. This is not an issue of righteousness. I can worship God any day of the week. Fine. But there were other things like this. Sexual immorality. Is God, does he understand when I'm dating someone that, you know, we just, we go on a date and we fornicate and I, you know, I'm not sure if I want to marry her or not. We need to move in first. Does God understand stuff like that or is that not acceptable? You're right. It is not acceptable. We were told that in the book of Acts. But you see, these things are happening in our culture. And what happens is, let's say that's one of your friends and they're not living right. And you say, hey, that's not right. And they go, don't judge me, man. And you get that flash card, which is basically that judgment is from God and I don't want it. So I'm telling you to get that out, of, get that out because if I don't see it, nah, 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 right, then I'm not accountable to that. Their soul already begins to be in great turmoil. The great secret that we have to share with people is that even then you have a choice. Repent. Turn. Tell God, I didn't know better. I was raised this way. Hey, I enjoy this. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. But if you do, I have to reconsider. And it's okay as long as you turn before it becomes permanent, right? It's like we talked about that guy. He goes to the store. He has all these garments shoved into his jacket. And he's ready to go. As long as he doesn't cross that metal line, he's not a thief. The moment he takes a step out of the store, he's busted. If he goes inside, he can look right at the door and have a change of heart, put everything back. He won't get in trouble. Even the store wouldn't get him in trouble because he has not done anything wrong technically. But the moment you cross the line without repentance, beloved, that's it. Hold fast to what you have until I come. To the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. Now, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, 
as when earthen pots are broken into pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father, I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let me address one thing here in the text, and then we'll go over some, uh, some situations here of judgments. Turn with me here to Psalm chapter 2. Because remember, now, remember Jesus re- releases things, attributes uh, about himself that we will need for strength. If you were going on a trip uh, to the wilderness and you found, and you're on a team with four guys, three of them are fashion designers and one's a survivalist, who are you going to have relief that's there with you? The survi- yeah, well, unless you're vain. Yeah, survivalist, great. Because it's wet and I don't know how to start a fire when it's wet and where's the food and where's all that stuff. You need someone who knows. So it's good that Jesus is revealing these things. What are we supposed to do with this data? Make an agreement with it. Lord, you are the judge. You know what you're doing. You know how to judge. All that you do is right. You judge impartial. You want me to be free. You're the type of judge who is there to protect my freedom, not to take it away from me. Look what happens here when Jesus says, this is amazing, by the way. This is about to be a a very great treasure for you. To the one who conquers and keeps my words to the end, to him I'll give authority of the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and earthen pots uh, are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from the Father, and I'll give him the morning star. Right? Hold fast to what I come. Now, what's happening? I will give him authority over the nations. Jesus is basically saying right now that he is going to give to you and to me, he's going to give us something that he has actually prayed for. This is amazing. Turns me to Psalms chapter 2. Now we are going to vector in on a conversation here between the Father and the Son. Between the Father and the Son... We are going to vector in here. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Come to help our tonight. Yeah. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay. Now, do you hear that language is very familiar? Mm-hmm. By the way, How do we know this is talking about Jesus and the Father? There is a reference to this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. For to which one of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Or again, when he brings forth the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. By the way, just a little side note. Every once in a while, you'll run into someone who knocks on your door. And they are they're either wearing a name tag or they're dressed really nice and they want to share their religion with you. And they always have the same thing. They want to take away the deity from Jesus and they say, you know, he's not worthy of worship. Well, right here is just an, it's another agreement you can make. The angels in heaven worship Jesus Christ. Okay? Not only do we worship Jesus Christ, The angels in heaven worship him. He makes his angels winds and ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, the scepter of uprightness and the scepter of your kingdom. For you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. By the way, do you know to be righteous, you have to hate unrighteousness? What a strong word, hate. We don't have hate in our vocabulary. Well, you need to. You need to hate what God hates. God hates injustice. I am in uh, verse 9. Matter of fact, how did Jesus have the oil of gladness? Because he loved what God loved and he hated what God hated. And again, someone would say, we don't hate anything. How could you be a person of God and hate? Well, very simple. If someone comes into your house and tries to rob kill, steal, and destroy? You, you, should I love that? No. Oh, I should hate that. I should hate that he took advantage of you. I should hate that he lied to you. I'm not saying you hate them. It doesn't say he hated the people. It says that he hated what? 
He hated wickedness. Beloved, you must hate wickedness and love righteousness together. You can't just have one. You have to have both. If you only hate wickedness and you don't love righteousness, you could be critical. If you only love righteousness and you don't hate wicked, you could be like those positive people. And I, I say that not in a good way, where everything's positive, but there's never a negative to the point where you could be living in sin and they encourage you like, well, you're doing this good, but they never address the one thing that is going to disqualify you. You have to have both. It's a balance of both. You have to love righteousness and hate wickedness. Amen? Amen. In the summertime, you want the AC to work. In the wintertime, you want the heater to work. You need to have red and blue in your thermostat, okay? In your spirit, you need to have red and blue. You need to love what's right and hate what's wrong. Okay, so it's clear here that Jesus Christ is talking to the Father. It's not the angels. We've ruled that out through Hebrews 1. And let's read what he says here. This is what the Father says. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Do you know that Jesus Christ could have said, well, that's great, Dad. Uh, I want a military superpower. I want nukes. I want finance. I want bonds, real estate, all of that. And instead, he asks for a handful of broken and weak people that he would perfect, that he would love, that he would summon into romance by his mercy and his goodness. You shall break them with a rod of iron, what's them, the nations, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, isn't this amazing? The Father is saying this to Jesus, okay? So Jesus in Psalms 2 asks for you and I, and then the Father says to Jesus, basically, you're going to have the rod. You, you, basically, you'll be unlimited and unstoppable. And now Jesus is promised to you and I, if you overcome, not only will you be the answer to his prayer, but what's he going to give to you immediately? The very thing he received from the Father. And now you are going to have a rod of iron. And as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, beloved, this judge not only is a just judge or righteous judge, he wants you to judge with him. Now, again, make the statement. Not only is God in favor of you, he wants you to be vindicated from the circumstance, situation, scenario. In other words, if you're lost, he wants you to be found. If you're found, he wants you to be uh, mature. If you're mature, he wants you to replicate that. He wants you to be with him where he is. That's what type of judge we're dealing with here. This is not just guilty or not guilty. This is not just pay the fine or be recompensed for what was taken from you. This is more like, I am going to help you overcome in life so that you can sit next to me because you have to be of a certain caliber and criteria to sit next to me. It reminds me of when Paul went to Rome, he says in his letter, I earnestly desire to see you and to lay hands on you and to impart some spiritual gift to make you strong so that you and I can edify one another mutually. That would be like saying, if I'm a chess champion, you've never played chess, I want to teach you how to play chess so that I can play with you. And you can be as good as, you know, we can compete and all that, but first I have to teach you the game. This is in the heart of Jesus. Why should you be afraid of that judge that not only wants to teach you and give you every opportunity to be vindicated and delivered and separated from the sin that is trying to disqualify you, he wants you to be away from that and then lifted up and then given sobriety and sonship so that you can sit next to him and judge the nations with a rod of iron. Why would you be afraid of that? Why? Because, well, maybe I didn't know that before. Maybe for lack of knowledge, men perish. Maybe I was never taught that before. Well, where do you see that in the text, right? Beloved, we can't take it for granted that Jesus Christ himself is our teacher and he's teaching us 
even now. He's teaching us the type of teaching that it says you need no man to teach you because you have the Holy Spirit or the anointing that teaches you all things. He is teaching us right now all things we need to be victorious in our Christian experience concerning hard things. Listen, judgment is hard. Do you remember when Solomon was on the throne and the one lady had a child and, and the other lady rolled over at night and suffocated her child and they both were fighting over the kid? And Solomon's like, oh, this is easy. Pull out the sword and cut the kid in half. And the real mom was like, no, you know, the other lady can have him. And it's like only love would fight for that, right? And the other lady's like, no, cut him in half. And it's like that was supernatural wisdom. What do you do when, you, when you've given your word to one thing and to another? What do you do when you're in a rock and a hard place? What do you do in life when they say sink or swim? You walk on the water. Neither. Check the box. None of the above. There has to be another way. And the answer is there is. It's Yahweh. There's always one extra. You know, in life you can be checkmated. And you pray one extra prayer and all of a sudden you look behind you and there's another row of squares all of a sudden. There's a back door. The Bible says that God will always make a way of escape if you ask for it. And many times I've had to depend on this uh, secret emergency escape route from the Lord. And it could be mentally, solically, spiritually, physically. But I promise you, as God said, his word is true. That there's always a a way of escape, a way for you to survive so that you can be in a wonderful position before the Lord. Talking about judgments, uh, I want to address something real quick because this is kind of the spirit uh, of understanding versus confusion. Let's go to Genesis 15, chapter 15, and go to verse 16. Genesis 15, verse 16. By the way, God is never surprised... He always knows what's going on, and he always works all things for the good for those who, what? Love him, yeah, and are called according to his purposes in Christ Jesus. Amen? What you're going to see here, uh, God's going to give us understanding. This could be kind of like, oh, that's confusing, or I don't understand that. Or it could be, this is giving us some insight into God's motive and the the, his modus of operation. So let's uh, go ahead and read. Uh, let's go to 14 to 16 in Genesis 15. But I will punish the nation for serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at the good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its fullness. Okay, so... Let's take the concept of time, time, and a half a time, and let's take the concept of what is full measure for sin. Or some of your Bibles will say uh, their iniquity, is, it's not the fullness of iniquity, or the iniquity has not. What does this mean? The iniquity is not complete, or it's not at full measure. Does that mean that they got, they have the stolen stuff on their person, but they haven't left the story yet? To make it technical, right? They've been warned once, twice. Okay, you get one more chance and they're doing still the wrong thing, but the chance didn't expire yet. Full measure, I'll give you an example. It's one thing for me to lie because I'm scared, like Peter did, right? They're going to kill him and he's scared. No, I never met the Lord. Really? You sat there and said, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. What do you mean you don't know the Lord? He lied. Why did he lie? Because he was afraid to die, right? That's just a fact. Now, is that different? Well, let me ask you this question. Why does Peter live and he lied three times with a curse or a vow, right? That's not just once. This is, yeah, this is now racking up a little judgment here. And Ananias and Sapphira, by the way, this is New Testament. Hear me now. This is New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira, they gave... Thousands of dollars. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars they give away, but they agreed beforehand. This is premeditated, right? Versus a crime of passion. They, they lied to the Holy Spirit and they lost their life that day, just like that. Now, why does Peter get a walk 
and Ananias and Sapphira walk no more. They both lied? What's the difference? Did they lie because they were afraid? Was it a crime of passion or was it premeditated? Yeah. You know what's different about that? A crime of passion's like, I would normally never do this, but I was scared and I just reacted. It reminds me there was a high school party and for some reason all these guys wanted to like beat up or kill this guy. So he jumps in his car and they're not deterred. They go over and they're trying to bash his window out. He gets so scared he steps on the gas and in the process he runs someone over and he goes to jail for manslaughter. Well, he would never do that. He was scared that they were going to kill him because they're using pipes to break his window in. Now, that's very different than someone goes, I'm going to wait till they get out of work at 5 o'clock and cross the street. I'm gunning it. And they draw it out and they find that stuff. That's no questions asked, right? It's a, it's a very different thing when you're of a sober mind and you are planning evil versus something happened and you responded and evil was a byproduct of this. Do you understand that Jesus knows the difference? There always is a different ramification, a different judgment, a different outcome uh, when these types of things happen. For Ananias and Sapphira, why couldn't they have just been reprimanded terribly? You know when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and Nathan comes and he gives him this beautiful story about shepherding and David's like, not in my place. You know, this shall be happening. And all of a sudden, Nathan says, you're the one who did this. And all of a sudden, David goes, and believe me, there was a cover-up. Don't act like there wasn't. But he goes, you know what? You're, I sinned against the Lord. And in the moment he was confronted face-to-face, -face, he, he, came, he came right out. And I said, Sapphira, not only, and by the way, why did they have to lie? They didn't have to. This is much worse. They could have said, yeah, we kept our money that we worked hard for and we gave tons to the church. Hallelujah. Be so blessed. They said, yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. But they lied about something. First of all, you lied about something you didn't need to lie about, number one. Number two, it's because they tried to create a reputation that wasn't correct as well. They tried to make themselves out to be more godly than they were. And in the process, they lied to the Holy Spirit who sees the secrets of men's heart. Now, if the Lord let that slough, that's okay. You can lie to God and, and it's, just, it's just fine. Well, what's the thing about the Holy Spirit? You know why it's so? Why can you blaspheme Jesus and be forgiven but not the Holy Spirit? You know why that is? Because the Holy Spirit requires trust, by the way. Can't see him, but you hear a little whisper. You have to trust in the Holy Spirit. And he is always true. And once you question him or his motives, beloved, that's out. It's kind of like if you have a best friend your whole life and all of a sudden one day they start accusing you. Not only they didn't ask you, did you do this? They start accusing you that you did something and you didn't do it. Tell me how your relationship is going to be after that. Very different. It's one thing is a, did you do that? No, I would never do that. Well, it happened. Okay, let's figure it out. And you find out it wasn't them. It was someone else. It's very different when you go, I knew you did this. You're the type of person, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you didn't even do it. Tell me your relationship probably won't survive that because it's very different how we approach these types of things. So Peter, honestly, he was scared. His fruit shows that he did die for God. So when he said, I'll die for you, Lord, that was true. He really meant that. And he did do that. History shows in the, uh, in the testimony of martyrdom. But what happens when you get tested, you realize what, what's inside of you. Now, you don't realize until there's a test. In other words, you know, I told you guys, I went to, the first time I went to Egypt, I'm this 24-year-old kid. I had never left. I think maybe I went to one of the states, but I was by myself on this trip. And I remember telling the Lord, oh, I would die. You know, my, one of our elders, Matthew Nation, such a precious brother. But he goes, brother, are you ready to go? Because they had, they canceled the church trip because there was, the Gaza Strip was flaring up and it really was dangerous. This wasn't like joking around. And he said, brother, isn't it uh, dangerous to go over there? And I said, brother, and I quoted Paul when he was going to go to Jerusalem. I said, not only am I ready to go, I'm ready to die in the name of the Lord. And he's like, you know, brother, amen. And hang up the phone and I'm feeling all like a whatever, you know, like a, yeah, like a hero or a spiritual giant. <laughs> Well, next thing you know, I'm riding through the Suez Canal. It's a 17-hour bus ride, me and a whole bus full of Arabs. 
We get to a checkpoint. For some reason, the guys with guns pull me out of the bus and start asking me very strange questions. And I look to the left, there's a hundred miles of sand that way, hundred miles of sand that way, front and back, and all of a sudden Jesus whispers to me, would you die for me here? And I go, uh, 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 and I'm, you know, it's like, and I even thought in my zeal, maybe it was folly, but it's like, I would be martyred for the Lord as long as it was televised and I was like, you know, everyone in the world knew I was this brave martyr, you know. But this was like, no one would know. You would just get an email that like, whatever happened to that missionary, that's it. You know, you would just be buried in the sand. And I remember telling the Lord, kind of like, you called my bluff. I, I, no way would I do this. But then I was like, but if this really was you, Lord, I would do it. You know, if this, for whatever reason, if this was your will, and the moment I said that, I had this peace came over me. The fear was gone. And I knew I committed myself into deeper hands, wider hands than even in all state, right? This is in the hands of Yahweh. Oh, you know, again, these statements you make, look, even if I die, I'm going to live forever. That's an important statement to make if you're afraid of death. I used to go to funerals and I would preach. You know, they would ask me to come preach at the funeral and give the eulogy and all this. And I used to ask the people, if you really believe you're going to live forever with this person, why are you behaving this way today? And you discover some people go, you know what? Actually, it's hard to believe in that. I, I can, every Sunday I go, yeah, I believe in heaven. We're going to live forever. And the moment they're faced, because by the way, you can't live forever unless you die. You have to shed off the, the uh, caterpillar to become the butterfly. And it's hard, beloved. These things are, if one of the chief apostles folded like a deck of cards in the face of death, this is hard. You can understand now why Jesus is going to such a degree to communicate with us about his heart and his will towards the church. I wanted to open the door to this because if you've ever met someone who was on fire Christian and then you saw him 10 years later and they left the church and you go, what happened? They go, well, and they tell you a story about a single offense. And you know what the common root of all of it was? They did not know the personality of God in that one trial, and they assumed the worst, or misunderstood the worst, however you want to say it. And what God wants to do is strengthen us, exactly like the church of Thyatira, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Sardis, and uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. He wants to strengthen us in such a way that no matter what we face in the days ahead, in Colorado, in America, wherever you find yourself, that no matter what life throws at you, the devil, his minions, uh, or you find yourself getting tangled up with, or whatever wonderful things the Lord has, no matter what it is, it, as it says, the man or woman of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? Amen. We will not be shaken, we will not be shifted, and we will not be moved unless it is by the Holy Ghost. Amen?